just thinking that affects your hormones. I repeat, how you think affects your hormones. The thing I find so fascinating as well is that you can take that same food and you put it in a different context and our body will use it completely differently. So you take that chocolate biscuit, you eat it in a training session or like around a training session and you don't see that spike because your body is using it up as energy. I'm really excited today to be talking again with Dr. Nikki Kay, all about the topic of low energy availability in endurance athletes. One of the things that I observed in my research, and it didn't come up as significant because that wasn't what we were searching for, but I noticed this sort of trend where is in from like racing nutrition, it was like three to five years of people making mistakes and under fueling before they kind of figured out something yep. that sort of maybe worked for them but it was like all those wasted potentially wasted years yeah, yeah, of yeah. trial and error fueling that if you can leapfrog some of that and have avoided some of the major <laughs> disasters in races um like some of the stories are amazing and that's the the things that people love hearing is is those stories of what has worked and what hasn't worked speaking the other day to uh, a rider who as a as a young woman had any eating disorders and has transitioned out of that into feeling for performance and is so also so passionate about um sharing that message and encouraging more especially for her like she was focusing on young women to getting encouraging them that actually it's important to eat more and yes you you do want to feel your bodies and look after your health and it does actually matter and just focusing on the skinniness and body composition and your appearance is not mm-hmm. the way to go if you want to be a strong um, robust healthy athlete and also a sustainable athlete because lots 100%. of the, the athletes and dancers also we put in the same category um mm. they come and say hey i'm i'm they kind of they do know something isn't right yet they 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 maybe convince themselves or they truly believe that they're fine and i i was one of them uh, you know many years ago it's like yeah like, look i'm doing well i'm fine i can't believe that i haven't quite got the balance of the nutrition and, and the training uh, you know you convince yourself um and it seems on the exterior that you're fine you're you're doing pretty well but mm. it, it's like you say it's that even if you don't get the stress fracture or you don't get a major thing mm. it's just quite sad that you're selling yourself short you're not reaching yeah. your full potential which is hence also why I put potential in the title of the book because we've yeah. each got our own individual potential goals for some it might be getting that gold medal at the olympics definitely not me by the way but or it (laughs) might be you know mine is just i want to do the best ballet class i can every time i turn up at the class whatever it is uh that you really want to do passionate we're talking about yeah um you know i'm afraid there isn't a shortcut (laughs) you know that's the other thing we want instant results we want who doesn't listen (laughs) Yeah, where would you play? Instant, uh, who doesn't? It's like tomorrow I win the gold medal, done, finished up. Uh, but <laughs> actually, you know, it is a process of, of getting there. And you're right, sometimes you, that does include mistakes. But yeah. if you could at least minimize, at least you start yeah. off on the right track, you're going in the right direction. And then yeah. it becomes just modification rather than having gone off a totally different fork, way yeah. off track. Now you've got to spend time and effort getting back vaguely onto the right path and then start, you know, fine tuning it. So if you could start off on the right, in the right direction at the very outset, then you will reach your full potential. Number one, sooner actually in the long run, Uh, but also, you know, for sadly, for some people going off track, off piste, Mm. you know, you never get back (laughs) Or, or you get back at a much lower point than you started you know yeah um, or it, take, it takes you so much longer like when you are in that state of low energy availability it does take you like three four times longer to recover and you're taking more time off and um sicker for longer and recovery is taking so much longer than so you're missing before. that that uh, opportunity that would be there would be there yeah to improve and, it's, and, it's and, get, and reach your potential up. Because one of the things I've been talking a lot about with my athletes recently is it's performance, not just on the bike, but it's performance at work and at home and performance for life as well. And how if we are under fueling uh, a training, a lifestyle, but it affects our cognition, it's affecting our mood and how we show up in everyday life. Like we might be just more grumpy and more moody and more um, 
Just well, we're not enjoying not... life. So when we say reach full potential, most people, I do mention performance sort of uh, as a subtitle. But mm. if I if I just said performance, then people would immediately think athletic performance. But potential yeah. encompasses everything. Yeah. Because listen, and it's, uh, ballet yeah. is my passion, right? Yeah. And that is the most one of the most important things in my life. But yeah. I still do have other things in my life. I've got my job. Uh, and my work and my mm. research I've got my family you know I've got my children you know actually everyone even even if you would say even if I was to say Bali is my priority yeah. I've still got quite a lot of other stuff that is also important and so mm. I think that's also you know maybe be that blinkered approach it's like I don't care about everything else I just want to perform but actually yeah. Is that really true? Is that really? If you think about mm. it, it's like mm, the most important thing in life are your connections, your relationships. And yeah. if actually being too single minded um, is going to break, you know, disrupt those the connections, the work connections, uh, your family or your social connections, actually, that's going to be a pretty sad process. <laughs> it's going to be pretty yeah. sad. So you're absolutely right. Um, you know, fueling for potential or fueling for mm. overall performance in yeah. everything because you know um even elite athletes who professional athletes who haven't got a, a when I say a job I mean <laughs> you know what I mean it's like that yeah. is their job I know but they're, they're not, not being paid for it as well not as going they to, ideally should be <laughs> yeah quite or then they haven't got um you know uh, whatever it is they they still everybody everybody has family everybody has friends right yeah. and those are the important people in your life so if you mm. cut yourself off from those because you are so single-minded I mean listen you do need to be of course I'm not suggesting that everyone you know takes it easy and doesn't bother with goals and potential of course mm. it's really important to have and it's laudable to be right I really want to do a bad good ballet class I want don't want to do about you know Absolutely. Mm. We should, whatever it is you want to achieve, of course, you should really try your hardest to achieve it. But the point is that if you're so blinkered that that is the only thing, mm. um, you know, that in that's not going to actually be healthy. It's not going to um, lead you to achieving that performance because um, I'm sure you found also um, in your research, Emma, that um, when I was writing my book and as I've done some other research um I have to be honest and I was a bit of an old-fashioned doctor <laughs> it's like I need the test I need the evidence yeah. I need the proof all this psychology stuff is like a bit yeah. but actually I stand corrected mm. um the more and more uh, I I read and write and research myself and I, I think you'll probably agree with this the more we have to, we realize, of course, we can't dissociate how our brain processes things with what our body does. Because our brain yeah. processes these inputs and makes an interpretation of them. The yeah, external even, and even the internal. Thoughts. Like there was, I mean, a paper popped up the other day. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. And I was like, oh, that's, in, that's an interesting one. I've got to flag that one just about how um, our beliefs about um, like sugar containing drinks or sugar free drinks, how our belief system and perception about that will influence how our body responds to that sugar or sugar free drink. And I'm like, yeah. oh, that's so trippy. Well, just, I'm, like, I've I'm, got another like one. Nutritionist, nutrition, yeah, I've got nutrition another is one just on so that. fascinating. Exactly. It's what you, Think about it, your interpretation of it. By the way, this is why placebo works, mm. okay? Because it, yeah. even if you give someone water and you tell them it has got sugar in, for example, or, or whatever, they, yeah. you know, that's why placebo works. It's mind over matter. Yeah. But I've got another yeah. example of what you're saying about how you think. Um, the drive to thinness. You've probably mm. seen that paper by um, D'Souza's re um, research group. And if you're an athlete and you are really concerned, you know, that that you get really anxious. I need to be lighter. I need to be slimmer. I need to look this way, blah, blah, blah. Drive for thinness. I've got to yeah. be thinner to, yeah. to, to win or whatever. Just thinking that affects your hormones. I repeat, how you think affects your hormones. 
So in this paper, they show that that um, suppressed, lowered T3, which is one of the hormones really, the thyroid hormone is really important for metabolic rate. So even just getting anxious about this, uh, this uh, cognitive restraint, uh, <laughs> one PhD student in Slovenia, interestingly, I supervised that was doing a study um, restricting energy for things uh, <laughs> in male cyclists. Mm. Um, and uh, anyway, part of the- Oh, yeah, of, I think that's, was that the you know three-step one? one? Yeah, the three-step one, exactly. Yeah. So just the initial thing, cognitive restraint, she called it. So yeah. them just thinking, I should, even if they ate the same as the other people, if you kind of feel a bit guilty or you, it's like, oh, I shouldn't, you know, that mm. again, so it's what we're talking about. So this psychology yeah. element is massively um, underestimated. And also in our dancer study uh, mm. with dancers from the questionnaire, we found that these um, thought processes, thoughts, uh, these mm. um, interpretations, I like to these yeah. psychological interpretations of, you know, our anxiety about shape and weight, et cetera, uh, mm. it reflected in physical, they were a lower BMI, um, it also um, reflected in terms of um, uh, menstrual function, mm. i.e. hormones. They yeah. were more likely to have a regular cycle. So physiological. So yeah. um, it's so I fascinating ha because I have flipped can't... backwards. Yeah, <laughs> you, I think this is the thing. It's it's so easy to just be like, okay, we just everything goes in its little box, and it's so interlinked. You can't you can't really separate them because the yeah, the longer that I've worked as a dietitian, the more I've realized how important psychology is to influence decisions. And you're right, exactly where I found the same thing in my research that a big, in my again, this is my interpretation of the evidence that I was, the data yeah. set that I was, I was, brought, I had and was that fears and around food a lot of mm. fears and beliefs about food being negative relationships mm -hmm. to like carbohydrates being labeled as bad or yeah, yeah. that it's unhealthy um these food fears and myths and beliefs would limit and influence people to avoid foods and limit foods that would improve their performance and their health in training yeah, and in it's, it's sad and isn't it it's vicious circle. it is yeah, yeah. And, and of course and it's definitely it, it, the conversations i'm having like mm. one on one with people all of the time. So the vicious circle thing, because of course, if you are this cognitive restraint, this anxiety, uh, restriction of food, orthorexia, avoiding carbohydrates because they're bad and evil anyway, <laughs> you know, uh, just those thoughts, like we said, will affect um, your health and your hormones. Mm. But by the way, then when you become, you know, unhealthy in the sense that your hormones are um, out of out of step, out of equilibrium, um, mm. then guess what? Now you're even less able to make really good decisions because yeah. your brain is, is very greedy, isn't it? It needs 20%, <laughs> I believe, of your energy intake. So, you know, you're literally starving your brain. And so your brain, and so actually there's this vicious circle. It starts off with an anxiety uh, miscue interpretation mm. um, and that affects um, your body, your, your health. And then that means that you're even less able to make those really um, good decisions and, and yeah. turn around and say, you know what, actually, uh, that's what am I doing? <laughs> What's going on? Um, you, yeah. you can't make those decisions. And actually also uh, in studies, I think you probably know that one by Alan Mellon. I love her research. Anyway, <laughs> she found that those athletes, female athletes who were amenorrheic because of low energy availability, they had the slower reaction time and mm -hmm. peak power production. So, yeah. you know, we have evidence uh, that the neurological system, um, yeah, it is a little bit in disarray as well. So it's yeah. one of those fascinating body you know, mind. Like it, it's, it's a snowball effect that it just kind of exacerbates it. Yeah. And, and often I'm talking with people and they they have this fear around food and, and, and craving food and particularly yep. like craving sugars and yep. feeling like they can't control about and and my my experience is often the result of the underfield training and recovery food and what's what's happened earlier in the day that's affecting later in the day and oh, yeah, yeah. If, you're, if you're if you're hungry then physiologically your brain is and your body is like I don't care what's going on just give me the sugar give me like wow, something exactly. quick and easy and you can have it's the best survival. power it's not it is it's not about that you're 
good or bad like it's or being disciplined or anything it's more just like your body's like I need food now give it to me now give it to me now yeah. well it's the opposite you're being because you haven't you know as you say been you've been under fueling during the day the classic <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, so you get this uh, energy deficit during the day your body mm. is your body wants to keep you healthy and alive that is its priority survival mm. survival so yeah. it's telling you, go and forage food, get food. I don't care what the hell it is. Actually, mm. you know what? A simple carbohydrate would be brilliant, the body's saying, because I can digest I that quickly. So I that's why quickly. you want sugar. That's why you want that thing. So it's yeah. not a weak. So actually what it is, it's not weak willpower that you, mm. you ignore these hunger cues. Actually, to be honest, it's not very, very well advised. Your body is giving you a massive it's a, it's red a alert. It's a natural response. It's giving you an yeah. SOS. So, you know, actually um, trying to deny it, it's not strong-willed. If uh, I might suggest that it's, well, it's ill-informed, it's not going to end well. But to avoid that, but I do understand, it is mm. it's almost a little bit scary when you do really feel you need to eat something. By yeah. the way, in women who have a, are having menstrual cycles in the luteal phase, you can often get these hunger urges because you've got increased metabolic rate with high progesterone. Mm. Simbolo, yeah. sim, sim, slimmer thing. Similar thing. You have these <laughs> hunger urges, but that, yeah. but so they're not, it's just the body trying to give you a message. That's all. But the key thing is what you said just there, avoid it. So you don't feel in that really scary state. We know what it is when you're just feeling a little bit uh, tremulous. Personally, I get a massive headache and I just like, <laughs> oh, I, I need some, you know, whatever that yeah. sign is. Yeah. For me, I, I get, I have low blood sugar anyway, naturally. So I just get dizzy and I get shaky and I, and I go very quiet. And <laughs> very you quiet. over. Yeah. And, you get and, like, and everyone's like, are you okay? And I'm like, I think I need food. <laughs> yeah. but, I stopped talking. Yeah. But you see, the thing is, listen, that can happen unintentionally that, you know, when you're working hard, like, you know, writing up your thesis or when you're a doctor, you know, you have the best intention, you're going to have lunch at one o'clock and then there's a busy clinic and then now it's three o'clock and uh, it's like things happen. So that's, you know, that's, mm. but if possible, try and plan in advance. I think that's what yeah. you're saying. Um, and, you know, fueling for the work required. Yeah. The lovely Dr. Sam MP um, on, the, on the forward looking schedule. So don't yeah. kid yourself that you're being really strong-willed to do faster training in the morning and have hardly no. eat anything. And then, surprise, surprise, you're going to be ravenous in the yeah. evening. Well, it's, it's so funny because literally I just posted a reel about this just before about like how I actually yeah, I very that. rarely recommend faster training because it's it's like, okay, let's put it in the context of the research and who was the study done and what happened. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, those participants, like all their food was provided for, there's no responsibilities, no life stress or anything going on. Mm. And they just had the rest of the day to kind of chill and do nothing. Where you take that into the real world where it's like, and they probably did have hunger and they probably were hungry in that situation, but they were like, not locked up or anything but they, they were like yeah, yeah they were in a war. they were in like a hospital war they weren't really doing anything. and but they 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 weren't just living everyday life and right. so it's if you're crazy if you're crazy hungry you've got like uncontrollable mm. hunger levels and I like I often use that hunger scale of like zero to ten and often I see if you're kind of like on a zero where you're so hungry you'll chew you'll eat anything yeah, you end yeah. up at a ten where you kind of like you're so full you you're sort of sick and so you take that faster training session that works in a lab very controlled environment or where all your food is provided there's no stress you don't have to think so again in a professional athlete setting it can work mm -hmm. if the context is right but you take that into the real world where people are working full-time and they've got um they're doing this faster training and then it's like oh they've 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 run to work uh, they've yeah. gone to work they've again missed a recovery sort of phase and then before they know it it's like midday they haven't really eaten anything and their body just starts like playing catch up down. and yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just like sort of yo-yoing energy and just feeling like they're, they're this binging or I can't control myself around sugar. And it's like, well, like, yes, in on paper, you're getting everything you need, but it's all coming in at the wrong time. Whereas if you shift all that back to the beginning of the day, it just calms that whole thing down. And you're actually able to create those deficits that you can stick with for the rest yeah. of the day, rather yeah. than it being like, Oh, let's just cut out a meal. And and pay for it with like crazy hunger levels and mood swings <laughs> and the rest of yeah. the day. Well, again, 
that I mean I can't put it any better than you but just is to um, go back to our lovely Anna Mellon in Denmark um, and there's the study that she did with uh, within day deficits as she called it so mm -hmm. even if you um, potted up the amount of calories by the way I don't I personally don't recommend that, but say in the study, uh, in the research setting, she totted up the number of calories that these people um, ate, um, you mm. know, not eating much during the day and then having a massive meal in the evening mm. um, compared to those that sp did spread it out. OK, so yeah. it was sort of a constant level, no big dips. And although on paper they were having the same amount of calories, Mm. Um, by the way, she controlled it, so they were doing. They were yeah, have, yeah. did have the same energy output. But anyway, um, uh, those ones that had this big gap, big energy deficit, and then had to overshoot almost um, yeah. in the evening, those ones had higher cortisol, stress mm. response hormone, and lower estrogen in the women and lower testosterone in the men. So again, um, clear evidence. So if people are questioning this and saying, ah, oh, but mm. I read that part of training is good. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And yes, it, it comes depends. down to the context. Yeah, it, like it, I it, see, exactly. I find for I find for the general population that a sedentary faster training can be helpful yeah, and exactly. can work in that environment. But what you take into endurance sport and I mean there was a paper that came out the other day in swimming about and it was sort of put getting the evidence for why people are so hungry after swimming yeah. and and I think there was another one about the benefits of having a bigger breakfast even like say, when the, it's controlled and again these are all things that we see in practice is that like yeah maybe like on if you're looking only at numbers it doesn't matter but you look at how the body's using that food yeah. and fuel and how it calms down all those hormonal responses and how you it, it makes it more sustainable for you. And I think for me, from my my perspective, it need, like the way we eat, it needs to be sustainable to, for course. it to last rather mm -hmm. than it being, obviously there's there might be periods of time where, okay, there's a, I'm going to knuckle down. I've got all the things in, I can mm -hmm. I can drop the other priorities. I don't, I've only got this one priority to focus on, put more energy and my attention, my nutrition now, but that isn't sustainable long-term. Yeah. And also you don't get those, you, you, you won't get the beneficial adaptations. Mm, uh, because yeah. if you've got low um, glycogen stores, you haven't got that top end for the, uh, you know, talking about swimming. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I used to do that early morning swimming. I think particularly in swimming, it is. Yeah. I have to say it is a nightmare. Uh, I'm sure you know in Australia, your, your great swimmers yeah. over there. But, you know, the training for swimming and also rowing and some other sports is typically in the morning. So when yeah. I was at school, every morning I had to be on the poolside at 6 a.m. sharp. So that mm. meant I had to get up at 5 or 5.15. And um, although I didn't feel like it, I would have a small bowl of cereal. Of course, it depends. Yeah. Cereal was my sometimes liquid something because yeah. even as a youngster, I knew I would crash and burn in that swimming session if mm. I didn't have some, something, you know. Um, yeah. And of course, afterwards, it's, so it's the before that's important. I'm sure you'll yeah. agree. Um, yeah. you know some sort of carbohydrate well, whatever they, all, they all matter for different reasons yeah also. and so that is before you because otherwise you won't get the most out of your training um, and then afterwards refueling in that magic I say 20 minutes I don't know if we could push it to 30 maybe but you know with the carbohydrate and protein exactly when I got out of the pool and when my sons also did early morning swimming I was doing this early morning training and I said to my mother oh my god I don't know why you did that for all those years I'm not going to do that for my children anyway lo and behold but <laughs> then the routine would be um, that, um, well, actually, I ended up going back to doing early swimming with them. But anyway, I would make sure that before um, I took them to school, we sat in the car or, or, you know, just having a moment at the pool after they got changed to have the flavoured milk and the banana. Uh, my, my youngest son got through many, many loaves of uh, <laughs> fruit malt uh, loaf. You know, that's that's really good because you yeah. need that to be prepared now to cover what's, you know, just to tide off what you've used and now he was ready to get on with his school day yeah. or your work or whatever it is and so you're ready for lunch because otherwise you're going to be catch up like you say all the time mm -hmm. but and also often it doesn't I find it just doesn't it often doesn't hit people till like six seven, oh, eight, later nine, on hours, you won't realize it's, yeah and so many times and this is why I love getting people just to not not as it's not even tracking but just recording thoughts and feelings and mood and hunger levels and and comparing that to like 
where, when is that consistently happening and look at where your energy and your food intake is coming from and so often like if people are for example tracking it for a period of time I'll see like oh, okay breakfast 300 calories this tiny little breakfast yeah. 300 calories at lunch like there's no there's, there's it's only it's only salad for example there's no bread there's no potato or pasta the and then come like four <laughs> o'clock it's like chocolate biscuits yeah, yeah. The, um and then lollies chocolates and the boy no they've eaten like 50 to 80 percent of their energy in snacks and these little things that don't really fill you up and satisfy yeah. you the rest of the day mm -hmm. and it's like okay well you should shift some of that into the yeah. earlier of the day but like more substantial food that's more filling that you enjoy yeah. to eat and it just calms everything down the rest of the day yeah, so because much. if you take those um you know those chocolate biscuits going to give you a massive insulin spike so mm -hmm. again you'll feel good for a moment but then yeah because your body has seen, oh, it's seen some food, uh, seen yeah. some glucose. It's like the insulin spikes up. You've got high insulin yeah. sensitivity. That's grabbed out of the system. And actually, you know how it is. You get the crash afterwards. So you feel good for a yeah. minute. And then it's like, oh, now I feel really bad again. So then you have another chocolate yeah. biscuit. It's just this yo-yo thing that isn't And, what's, and the, the thing I find so fascinating as well is that you can take that same food and you put it in a different context and our body will use it completely differently. So yeah. you take that chocolate biscuit you eat it in a training session or yeah, yeah. like around a training session and you don't see that spike exactly. because your body exactly. is using it up as energy. And so that's one of the things I say to people, like if you take that food if and push it into your training, if some way or shape and like whether it's banana bread or cookies or biscuits, like use it as fuel in training that you enjoy, that you yeah. like it and like get rid of the guilt or that you've got to earn it. It's not about earning it or anything like that. It's just like your body is needs energy Need and that's it. the best time to be providing extra energy and like, yeah, yeah like, like mm. reduce the, the intake of those extra, cause they're extra foods. Um, but if you're having extra, tra you're training, your body needs extra energy in that mm. moment, but it, it comes down to the timing so much. Yeah. And I think the context, that's, that's the key word you use there, the context. So I've got nothing against chocolate biscuits, although they're probably a little <laughs> to eat on the bike but anyway you know actually and and for dancers in between running between a rehearsal and the class actually do you know what you can have a sweet you know you yeah. can have a, an energy bar you can you should um so yeah. the context that's absolutely you need it during mm. this uh the the yeah. Those, this, the this goes back to those food fears where there's yeah. I see so much like oh that's bad that's that's good that's bad I'm trying to be good I'm trying to be clean and that's bad for, and it's like again it, it's it's never good not bad unless you're allergic to it's poisoned or like it's <laughs> it's physically like spoiled yeah, yeah. and it's it's never good nor bad it's just it comes down to the timings the frequency and the portions and so yeah. it's like okay well look at when you're having it and is there a more optimal time that you can have it and enjoy it don't enjoy it yes get the most enjoy out of it, it. Mm, yeah, right. I mean, like, enjoy it. psychology like the number of time yeah like and the number of times that i find people that like say they're using energy gels when they're training on a bike and they actually hate the one that they've used and so they never eat it because and they don't realize that until we've started i guess talking about it and it's been all around the countryside in their back pocket and but they, they actually don't like the taste of it whereas oh. okay well what do you like a chocolate biscuit i can have that like, yeah of course yeah, of like course, it's going to provide you the same amount well, of energy is that ah, absolutely you, you've got to have something you like but again going back to the context of when you're eating yeah. these foods but also who you are because you know um i've worked uh in the na in the good old nhs uh, i used to for many many years in diabetic mm -hmm. clinics type 2 diabetic yeah. clinics where people by their own admission hated exercise mm -hmm. and they were frankly overeating for their requirements yeah. and so again in their case in their cases yeah chocolate biscuit probably isn't a good idea at any time frankly yeah. right so this is the thing there are so many messages out there and we yeah. have to remember that, that sadly there is indeed an obesity epidemic mm. so we have this contrast of these sorts of people who yeah. i would be saying to don't eat in a chocolate biscuit and yet we have People who are exercising, often, as you say, endurance, a high level, high energy demands, when we mm. say, absolutely, if you like, yeah. if you like chocolate biscuits and you're out on that ride, yeah. eat it, please, yeah. please eat it. Right. So, again, it's not only the context of when you eat it, but it's who you yeah. are. I mean, obviously, yeah. we are talking um, to, to athletes more at this point, but I think also athletes should be aware but yeah. with social media messages out there 
Um, you know, not every message, in fact, I doubt many messages, apart from the things you post, of course, um, <laughs> are going to be, oh, oh, you know, are going to be actually relevant they're to not, There's you. very few things that are universal. Like, I remember no, I did a, a, a talk at a conference for Diabetes UK, oh, mm. going back a few years ago, and it was about the, like, the eat well plate and, like, oh, yeah. and uh, are they out of date and what should we use instead? And and I was like, okay, if we, say we look at people who are living to their hundreds and above, there's these population groups all across the world in like Peru mm-hmm. and the, the, the Netherlands, uh, not the Netherlands, but in the Scandinavia, yeah, yeah. Um, Japan, and they've got very, very, very different diets. Yeah, and but it the, works. The, the patterns, and some of them have fish, some of them mm-hmm. don't. Some of them have dairy, some of them don't. Some of them have lots of oils, some of them don't. And like, But the key things that are consistent upon amongst that is like there is a lot of plants and like as in mm. fresh fruits and vegetables um plenty of fiber and there but there's also a lot of exercise exercise not even like training but just being very active yeah, active and, active yeah yeah being active individuals and socializing and stress oh. like they're kind of like the 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 common themes that you see amongst yeah. those the, the blue zones whereas the like whether you choose to add meat or you choose to add dairy like that's I guess, up to the individual personal preference, but you can incorporate it and still have a healthy long life, but it comes down to the whole, your whole lifestyle. The whole picture, but that's actually, and that's one of the things in my book, I go through the seven ages of man. Well, and woman, of course, and athlete, a la Shakespeare. Um, And, uh, you know, the sort of final thing, which Shakespeare calls dotage, in other words, old age, uh, Japan, they have the longest life expectancy, but it's not just by the way, oh, I can live to 100. It's your quality of life, of course. But anyway, the one yeah. of the reasons why, but actually Japan ticks both space boxes. Not only do they live quite long, but they actually live um, in a healthy uh, quality of life is pretty good. Yeah. And actually, yes, we can talk about that. We can talk about this and that. But you know what? It was the social context because mm. they are very... Um, you know, they respect their elders, they have these social groups, um, Mm -hmm. you know, where they meet up. So uh, again, it's the whole picture of the person. And food, absolutely. Very, very nutrition. You can't separate it. It's got to be, you've got to look at the whole picture. And so I think I often like to link about it, but yes, it's nutrition, but it's also movement and mindset and the the social element, like you say, you can't, you can't separate what we eat to that I mean and often talk about like say it's your grandma's 90th birthday and there's like you're going to celebrate it and it's that that's not every day that you go and so maybe there's champagne maybe there's cake and like it's like take take a step back and like what's the context of this and how often do I have these foods if it's every day it's like okay then there's ways you like like but if it's Mm. once in a blue moon once once in a lifetime yeah 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 (laughs) yeah enjoy it celebrate it well it goes back to the psychology and the enjoyment you know actually Food, yes, is nutrition at its basic level, but it's far more than that. It's also, like you say, the social aspect of eating it and your interpretation of it um, and enjoying it. Like you gave the example of people that actually they don't even like it. It's like, listen, that's not going to work. If you don't like the taste of it, (laughs) it's a non-starter. Find something that you do actually like um, and that that for you that's going to work for you you know whatever your requirement is uh, and again but the requirement will change so going back to the seven ages of an athlete uh, mm. you know um, sadly I see a lot of um, children being encouraged mm. to train like adults um, mm. you know so of course there's the training itself isn't appropriate but also yeah. you know you can their energy systems aren't developed so you know, we have to also put it not only in the context of the individual, but we also have to put it in the context of their age. How old are they? Um, And because that's going to change, their hormones are going to change, of course, over their life. So again, it will need these modifications and fine tuning. So I think that's the other thing, because I mean, I have to be honest, I'm a bit, a little bit like this as well. I I am quite stuck in my ways. I like to have my routine. It's da, 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 da. But it's ridiculous to think at my very ancient age, as my children like to remind me, I'm, you know, I have to be realistic. My hormones aren't like that they were when they when I was, you know, younger, and yeah. therefore, and what I'm doing is slightly different there as well. So of course, I've got to modify. So I think athletes shouldn't be scared or afraid. Oh, I can't do that. It's it's different. It's not on the schedule. It's like you yeah. have to have that little bit of 
um, flexibility, I, th I think. And, and understanding what, what things are a priority, depending on what stage of life people are yeah. at or what level that they're training or what, what their goals are in that sort of moment. Yeah, because the older athlete, the master's athlete, I'm seeing more and more of master's mm -hmm. athletes and good. Why not? Yeah, uh, no, no, 100%. I, I'm all for the, the older uh, the athletes. Yeah. I'm including my husband. <laughs> anyway, uh, my, my eldest son is a cycle coach. And for a while, he was um, training, uh, coaching my husband, which was an interesting dynamic. But anyway, one of the things that my son was quite insistent on was that my husband should be doing strength training, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but also the nutrition, actually, to be fair, is nutrition was pretty good. But, you know, master's athletes don't realize they think, oh, I can train like I was when I was 20. You do have to change, I'm afraid. You have to look more at the strength training and the nutrition, the protein, right? The protein intake yeah. becomes more, even, you know, even more of a priority um, to keep those muscles going because, yeah, it's a little bit more hard work, shall we say, as we get older because our hormones are a little bit lower, but that's, that's fine. That's a challenge. We're up for yeah. a challenge. That's normal, natural physiology. So mm. we just have to, you know, accept that, adapt and modify mm. and, uh, and change uh i mean what's your view on that i think that we've already you know the age i think is a very important uh well, like thing. i mean obviously like with with women like we've we've got monthly cycles and yep. then this and the, the, but even it just changes with each decade yeah yep. it changes so it's a it's, it's a constantly moving target and i mean right. and i know it's probably a controversial statement but i really don't think we will ever come up with some population levels this is all females nutrition sort yeah. of guide or training guidelines because there is so much variation in experiences between women but also within the same woman and yeah. mm. so I think I, I think there is obviously things that are priorities that change but it's understanding how uniquely each woman responds um, and what are the patterns and how to what things testing and adjusting what things work for you around around mm. that and understanding what what happens to yourself um whether it's like with fluid retention or weight sort of changes and and but I mean it's funny like it's, I mean obviously as women most women have a cycle every every four weeks or so and but it is still just funny how like it's it, it's always a surprise it's like oh it's back again everyone <laughs> like you've had it for like Whoa, years or years yeah, of yeah, yeah. it's still a surprise it's like oh why is this what's going on and you're like ah oh, okay that's why my weight has all of a sudden gone up a couple of kilos and it's like why do my clothes not fit and they're like everything it just and it's like oh and then a week later you're like oh like I've shrunk again because I don't have all the extra fluid on and so when we know those patterns that we have uniquely mm. we can then make changes and learn to tame down our monkey mind that's stressing about this change yeah yeah well they go, we go back to the psychology but um just to pick <laughs> up on that about the the women the you know um female hormones are amazing i love them because yeah. they are complicated i love them um yeah. you know beautiful <laughs> choreography um amazing and actually that's yeah. also one of the themes of my book i call it the yeah. female hormone odyssey because it is a journey okay. not yeah. only from but from cycle to cycle absolutely for your individual but you make a very good point there I have I have, what you said just there is what lots of athletes and dancers say to me it's like it sh I know it shouldn't be a surprise but it kind of is but again um you know you don't have to have fancy apps and mm -hmm. things like that I mean old-fashioned I used to you know just make a little note in my diary across it will do but just being a body aware and so mm -hmm. like you say you don't have to go through that oh what the hell's happening and getting yeah. to understand and love and tune in to how you change but also not being freaked out if it is slightly different from cycle to cycle yeah. and very importantly if you are different to your teammate which you will be mm. we're not all clones yeah. there was an excellent and, uh, article there was a paper of... that came out oh, yeah. a couple Maybe of a while ago <laughs> it's probably the one you're thinking of about um perceptions and beliefs of yeah. an elite female athlete and i found that fascinating because Again, it comes back to the psychology of like, if you believe that your cycle affects you negatively, it will. Of course but, it will. And yeah. I mean, I had this conversation just coming back from the world championships the other day and with someone and, we'll, and someone was, a lady was saying to me how, okay, yes, I, I feel that it affects me, but I, I also have evidence that I've got my best power numbers. Like I might physically feel rubbish, but I can still perform and push through that if I, yeah. if I'm mentally, yeah, yeah. if I'm mentally prepared and, and I think that's the key thing where like 
sometimes you aren't going to have a choice. You're going to, have, if you're an athlete and you're competing, like yeah, your right. race, if this is your yes. race day, you can't change that. No, you can't change the world championships race. Sorry, no, that's it. That's the date. But if you believe that your your performance is going to be bad because of that, then it will be because mm. you're preempting that. Whereas if you're in the mindset of like, okay, maybe I don't feel so good, but I know mentally yep. that I can push through it and you I'm tough and I'm strong, then yeah, it's oh, it's so fascinating that the psychology component of it, like, and again, yeah. this is why I think it's so complicated. Where it's like, will we ever have a will we ever have the true answer to this? Well, the thing is, because well, in some ways, no, because it's so personal, and the, I do get a little bit irritated just saying my book. It's again generic advice. Apparently, mm. every woman should feel amazing just before ovulation. Apparently, and yet yeah. Lizzie Dignam, one of our top um, cyclists. She, um, you know, wrote her personal experience. She had read this, that, oh, you were meant to feel amazing. And, and indeed, her teammates around her were saying, oh, we feel amazing. And she was, mm. she, she said that was the worst time for her. She felt, she didn't yeah. feel good. And she thought there was something wrong with her. But then yeah. she came to accept it and say, well, listen, this is just me. But again, it was mm. the psychology. She, number one, realized that was, that was her. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. That's how she experienced it. But also the psychology, it just meant, that she wouldn't put so much pressure on herself. She could still push through, as it were, of course, but that she would just find it a bit harder for her personally. But it's yeah. about the psychology accepting that you are, every woman is an amazing, unique individual. So don't be scared to do what's right for you. And although yeah. there are some theoretical things, I mean, for example, <laughs> we definitely do know that progesterone, the one thing I'm certain about is that progesterone does uh, increased metabolic rate and you are more prone maybe to hunt these mm. hunger urges unless you've been preemptive and, mm. and whatever but, but generally it is but funny otherwise though, because I, tear it up like, otherwise tear it up those generic advice right just do what's right for you yeah. and I, I, the thing i find is it all for me it always comes back to is this clinically relevant and like, yep. it might be it might be statistically uh, relevant yeah. but is it clinically relevant yeah, and yeah. like a gram difference 50 calories more i'm like is that actually does that justify this advice like oh you need more energy here and I'm like oh, yeah well, that's really? a very good point it's all very well in the lab in the research we're talking about statistical significance we want the p-value we have to have this magic number but then you come down to clinical significance yeah. So and, does and it, generally does it, most people just adapt their food intake and just increase it naturally exactly. without having to so, force it. No, so, but it's just being aware. I think nevertheless, being aware, but there's a difference between the researchers and the p-values, as you know, and then what does that actually translate to in practice? Does it actually make, give a bean? And in any case, are you naturally adapting anyway? Maybe? Just one more thing about women. So yeah, menstrual cycles are, are um, yeah, individual but also the, you know, this female hormone odyssey and the, over the lifespan. And we have to say about the Narcissus athletes, the perimenopause, menopause. And then, then of course we have the sort of female hormones. Uh, yeah, they get a bit out of sync. That's perimenopause that's happening. And menopause is when the hormones just like the ovaries stop working in terms of hormones and ovulation, that's it, boom. And because these hormones are so important for all many aspects um, of health and performance, then that can that is truly a big challenge. But what I would just wanted to say is that um, the good news is that we know that keeping active, continuing with your exercise is definitely going to help, number one, the symptoms. There's good evidence for that mm -hmm. and your health in terms of uh, bone health, et cetera. Uh, but also my experience is that, um, you know, HRT, hormone replacement therapy for menopausal mm -hmm. women, there are four, Fortunately, there aren't many women in whom it's contraindicated. Sadly, there are some women okay. that do get breast cancer. And so, you know, uh, if it's estrogen receptor positive, then I'm afraid HRT is off. But thankfully, that's not many. But for most women, there, there is not a contraindication. Mm -hmm. And so I'm uh, more and more, well, I always was, but, you know, explaining mm -hmm. this to um, the Masters athletes and saying, look, at the very least, try and see. You know, the HRT. It's not the elixir of youth, sadly. There isn't any. No. But so you won't suddenly feel like 21 again, but you will feel better than you were back to what you would like to feel for you, whatever your age is, 51, say. Um, and, uh, you know, also to say that um, to be patient, that, you know, I say, go away, try this for three months and then come back 
we might have to just slightly adjust the doses so you get the most. So definitely, I would say um, for Martha's athlete, HRT is helpful. Um, sadly, for women, um, testosterone is not allowed, even if it's as a replacement, because it's banned mm -hmm. by WADA. That's okay. a whole discussion for another day. Whether that is mm -hmm. fair, I'm not sure. It's because it's not for performance, it's for quality of life. But anyway, we leave that there. So that was my find, that was my thing about the women. But do you want? Shall we say something about men? Then? Well, yeah. Well, that, I guess that leads on into the men um, quite nicely. Talking, bringing up the testosterone because I think obviously with women, there's if people are in a low energy availability state, there is that clear indicator of yep, yep. periods going a bit awry, whereas it isn't necessarily as obvious with men. And one of the things that for me was the big standout. Um, um, conversation point I should say with the the paper that you had about that with the male athletes yep. with the three steps was the impact on uh, libido and sex drive and morning yep. erections and yep. how that as a as a sub as a marker of yep. low energy availability and it's been fascinating talking about that um, with some of my male cyclists and they've been like and then being able to then reflect on previous points in their life where they've been training really hard haven't mm. been feeling well and they're just really low in energy and really low on libido and, so, and they've been like oh that's that's why mm, exactly so that it's the sort of equivalent of having periods in a woman right because we make yeah. estrogen and test and um uh, progesterone we do make some testosterone but the men of course you know it's the other way around they make way more they do by the way have estrogen um but mm. they're much more testosterone and so the equivalent of periods in a woman is what's the uh, function of the testosterone and there's the, the should be it should peak in the morning hence early mm. morning erections right and mm. so that is actually a very I mean listen we ask women about periods so um, <laughs> I mean I'm a doctor so I guess it's okay I just ask yeah. them straight up I don't make it it's like listen just to get an idea you explain and in the yeah. questionnaires I make of course you can't just asking that straight up as the first opening question probably is a little bit <laughs> confronting <laughs> yeah. right but, like oh hello like, yeah, well, hold on away I'm in the right place anyway but but you know explaining why to get an idea yeah. of how clinically effective or, or whatever your level of testosterone yeah. is I need to know or can you tell me just give me a score you know um out of seven how many morning erections right and exactly mm -hmm. that's a very simple straightforward thing to do I mean mm -hmm. because not everyone will have access to testing I mean obviously yeah. It, it, it's lovely if you have the blood test and we can have a look see where exactly the testosterone level is but actually just asking that simple question um mm. as you would do to and, a woman uh to yeah. have you got periods and, you just ask them that and that's the equivalent and actually and then we get an idea and like you say then it, then they realize they reflect on it it's like oh that actually that's a good point and then it all makes sense uh, yeah. and all ties um ties in uh, and again you know the evidence <laughs> the physical evidence that actually you know you're you haven't got that right balance of the training and nutrition yeah and i think like, i think one of the things in my own research has been very much what is the driver for people's choices or decisions to do things and what motivates or encourages people to make change and what's important to them and the priorities and um and recognizing that why having the energy it's not just for performance it's not just to say you've got strong bones 20 years down in the track it's like it's affecting so many things mm, here yeah, and now yeah, in your everyday exactly. life and um, but the one thing about the men so yeah that can definitely be an indicator um but uh you know then you the you know some athletes will say okay well fine can i have testosterone placement and just to mm. reiterate no you can't i'm afraid or wada says no um, mm -hmm. even because if it's low because you've got this imbalance in your training and your nutrition that's a functional issue so mm -hmm. you won't get um, a TUE right for yeah. testosterone and you, well yeah you could end up in serious trouble and banned basically so um, you have to address that and also then I have some masters athletes saying oh well you're recommending HRT to women how mm -hmm. about some testosterone for yeah. if I'm over 50 <laughs> it's like listen guys <laughs> very I, different stories here listen guys you know with all due respect yes your testosterone goes down a little bit the normal range for under 50 something like um eight to 30 let's say nanom and a nanomole per liter roughly let's have that as a figure in our minds 
over 50, it just goes down a little bit from six now to about 28 nanomoles per litre. So yeah, there's a little difference, but not like massive. But whereas women, um, you know, the peak of the progest of the estrogen during the menstrual cycle, let's say, is a thousand picomoles per litre. Okay. Mm. After menopause, you'll be lucky if it's a hundred, a hundred picomoles mm. per litre. There's a big drop. Huge change. So, yeah. so that's why, guys. Sorry, it's not that you know I'm being unsympathetic, but that is the science behind it. But the good news is you can still maintain or you know make the most of your testosterone by doing, guess what? The strength training we talked about earlier, there are other lifestyle or training factors and the, the nutrition like we discussed. So yeah. um, there we go. That's like that. the nutrition, like low carbohydrate, low energy diets, like very rapidly will drop it and cut it and make it yeah, go down. Exactly. And so the, again, it just comes down to the, the, the feeling around the training and the whole, it all matters. The, the whole picture. Sort of exactly. Things. Yeah, there we go. So your book comes out, so your book comes out, this month, I mean October, and yeah. what's the so who is aim, is aimed for everybody? Like who who is who is aimed for, and what what's the the key messages coming in your in your book? Why should everyone go buy it? Quite okay. So, um, women's health and human potential. Yeah. Um, it is for everybody, although I have to admit that it is more for athletes or exercisers. But I think it's nice as way of contrast that, you know, we have on the one hand, like we said, metabolic syndrome, obesity crisis uh, with effectively too little, too little exercise, too much nutrition maybe for requirement. And then we have the athletes with res at the, at the end of the scale. So it is for anybody, although I suppose mm -hmm. the people that maybe will get the most out of it are people that are exercisers, not athletes, but exercises, whatever level. Um, and the book, um, because I mentioned I like dance and ballet, um, the book is in two acts. Hmm. Act one is sort of explaining what hormones are. It will touch hmm. on the effects of your choices around nutrition, uh, training and sleep. So it will sort of give you the theory, I suppose we could call that. And there's a mm -hmm. big old chunk about red. So uh, you know, everyone, you can get there with all the references and diagrams and everything. And then um, act two is going, doing the seven, seven ages of an of man, woman, athlete. So I will go through from baby all the way through to dotage, as Shakespeare calls it, mm -hmm. um, on the backdrop of these hormones are changing. So now mm -hmm. what do you need to be aware of, what you need to do to change? So, mm -hmm. um, and each, um, especially in the second act, um, well, in fact, all of them at the bottom, there are sort of there's a sort of a summary of top tips. So what what's take take home points or whatever one calls them, you know, and also yeah. there will be interspersed. I'm calling them hormone stories. Okay, just to be yeah. clear, just to be clear, they are not specific yeah. people. Right. Mm -hmm. But I have given them names because just names I picked out of the air, as it were, because I think people relate to that. So in case people are saying, oh, my goodness, she's publishing patient. No, I'm absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> just to make that clear. Um, yeah. And, you know, they are they are true stories, but in the sense that sometimes I've sort of put bits, you know what I mean? So yeah. it's not literally, oh, this is deaf. This is a person called Ben, someone out there. There won't be. Yeah. All right. Okay, yeah, it's it might just, be like you've seen this from like two or yeah, three yeah. people in a similar so, situation. Exactly, in the name. So just yeah. to make that clear, but it is nevertheless, it gives you a flavor of, okay, this person is coming along saying whatever. Um, yeah. And now that's sort of a teaser at the beginning. And then uh, at the end, it's like, okay, now you've read the, the you know, the, the scene, the chapter. Yeah. Now here is what's going on and, and what's, what recommendations um, I gave the person, he or she or whatever, and what happened next. So it will give you, um, so yeah, hopefully it will give lots of useful information and it, there are references, okay, mm -hmm. at the end of the book. It's definitely not a PhD, by the way, um, yeah. but it, and it, so it's not a textbook, don't be scared. But it is nevertheless, people, I, you know, um, want to respect them and give them the evidence and so you can if you want to go and look at the references mm. and and it's it's based you know um but it's got the extra feel um uh, about the top tips and about the hormone stories so i hope that literally anybody will get something from this book um whatever level of exercise you are and whatever age you are so even if you're looking at it you're looking at this book and you're a parent and you you're really interested about your child 
uh, and you mm. want to know what's what's going on there or mm. if you are a master's athlete and you're you know what I mean or if you're a coach yeah. or whatever so hopefully it will fit all that so yes um it's out on uh when I was discussing with my publisher right what date to publish it's like can we make it my birthday then it's a date I will remember so it's the 28th yeah. of October you can order pre-order it now and yeah. you can get a 20 percent discount on Excellent. my publisher's website, uh, Sakoa Books, um, if you enter the code, very secret code, Nikki, N I C K Y. Easy. If you're like so, that's, yeah. so that's about the book. It will also be on Amazon. Before we wrap up, Jed, any final words of wisdom? Um. Well, actually, the quote that I open my book with, which is sort of uh, the whole thing about, um, did you know that two thousand years ago? Hippocrates, good chap, he said he would have made an excellent coach because he mm -hmm. said the surest way to health is if we could give each individual just the right amount of nourishment and exercise. He was talking about personalized medicine. He was talking about uh, periodized uh, nutrition mm -hmm. and training, was he not? He yeah. was onto something that that guy but he didn't know why he he said this yeah. but because he had observed it but he didn't know why or, or how but now we do the answer is hormones which is hence uh i explain why hypocrisy was <laughs> was right effectively amazing well i can't wait to read it and um congratulations on getting it um out finished and out there and thank you again well congratulations on your listen first of all congratulations on your phd and oh, thank I think you will also write an excellent book in the future. But thanks so much, Gemma, for having me back and discussing. It's It's been a pleasure. We could talk all day and discuss. We could we? talk for hours. We could so, talk yeah. so we'll, 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 there'll be more of these, I'm sure. So. Yeah, no, it would be lovely. Um, excellent. Oh, thank you very much. I hope you have a great day. And I will speak to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Gemma. Right, bye. Bye.